Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Shutter Lounge. The Shutter Lounge is a virtual venue experience created by Private Drama, Wise Productions and Solar Flare Studios. The venue is fully customizable and is suitable for networking, awards, galas, executive events, parties, internal and external comms, staff reward events, product launches and fundraisers. In fact, if you can imagine it, we can create it. But today we're here to talk about hybrid events and how to deliver them successfully. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our host for today, Callum Delito, who is the editor of Conference and Incentive Travel. Hello and welcome, I'm Callum Delieto and this event is all about exploring this new reality that we've found ourselves in and how we can successfully stage hybrid events. Before we get into the discussion, I'd like to introduce you to our fantastic panellists. So, starting with you, George, from Wise Productions. Hi there, how are you doing? Hello. Louisa from Polar Black Events. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you. Liz from Historic Royal Palaces. Hi there, thanks. And Adam from Private Drama Events. Good afternoon. Now, before we do get into this discussion, I'm keen to see some of the adventures that you guys got up to recently at Kensington Palace, and you showed us how a successful hybrid event could and should look. So let's have a quick look at that. Hello, my name is Adam Blackwood, and I am from Private Drama Events, and I'm standing in front of the beautiful Kensington Palace, where we have staged countless parties and events. As we navigate the event roadmap out of lockdown, extended reality will continue to play a large part in our event planning. Hybrid events will form very much part of that planning. But what does that phrase hybrid events actually mean? Well, hybrid events combine the physical and virtual realm into one giving digital and virtual audiences and live audiences the same real-time experience. But what does that actually look like? Well, let's go inside the palace and meet Heather Thomas from Historic Royal Palaces and find out. Historic Royal Palaces is an independent charity dedicated to the preservation of six world-renowned palaces. They are the Tower of London, Hampton Court Palace, Banqueting House, Kensington Palace, Kew Palace and Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland. Our events guests come from all over the world as well as here in the UK and London and they're attracted to us as a destination because we have such amazing heritage and history and it is so important for us as a charity to be able to host events as it allows us to fulfil our cause so that we're able to preserve these palaces for future generations. Events at the palaces are nearly as old as the palaces themselves such as medieval banquets that took place in the 12th and 13th century at the Tower of London, the mask balls during the Stuart era at the Banqueting House, and the riotous Georgian parties that often lasted until the next morning here at Kensington Palace. For us in the events team, we're continually inspired by our palaces and their ability to adapt, grow and change over time. And now in 2021, we face a new challenge how do we invite guests safely into our palaces to experience them in all their glory? And now I pass you over to George Foden from Wise Productions in the King's Gallery. Hi, I'm George from Wise Productions. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we've installed here today at Kensington Palace. So as you can see, over my shoulder, we've got a two-person studio set up here in the King's Gallery. And we're working in the King's Gallery today because it affords us plenty of space for social distancing and working in a COVID secure way. We've also brought all of the technical equipment needed to get this studio broadcast on air live. So we've got all the video mixing and streaming technology and the sound equipment for really clear, crisp, pitch perfect sound. So elsewhere in the building here at Kensington Palace, we've got a live event going on with guests in the room. And we're gonna bring elements of that event here into the studio for exclusive online content for the audience watching the live stream. Now we've also got our studio live back at Wise Productions HQ, and that's where the main MC for the night will be. So we've effectively got three elements to bounce between for the online live stream. We've got the live event with cameras in the room to capture that key content from the event. 
But when those guests are having their dinner, we're coming to this studio, and then occasionally we're bouncing back to the studio at Wide HQ, where the host is bringing the whole experience together. And that's why we think this sort of arrangement is going to be key to the success of a hybrid event, keeping the content moving, keeping that online audience engaged. It's not gonna be enough for a hybrid event just to have cameras in the main room streaming what's going out. People need to be engaged, the action needs to keep moving, and that's why we think what we've done here today is really an example of how hybrid events could look in the future. So, it looks like hybrid events are here to stay. The balance between the emotional engagement at the live experience and the digital interreaction between the virtual audience provides the opportunity for much wider access, democratising the whole event and providing rich legacy and return on investment. I can't imagine anything that an event planner would want more. But it's not just about what I think. Let's hear from our panellists back at the Shuttle Lounge. What I would give to go to a riotous Georgian party. Yeah. You know, that is something that uh, is, is clearly missed at the moment. However, hybrid events are, are certainly satisfying the hunger that everybody has right now to, to attend and interact with each other. But I'm curious to explore the landscape, right? So we know what the last 12 months have been like. Disastrous. But it's really, really positive. It's feeling very, very positive. And I think the whole industry is, is getting a sense of positivity injected into them right now. So what does the present and future landscape look like for events in all of your different fields of expertise? Um, maybe starting with you, Louisa. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. There has been a shift, um, you know, very recently, I think, since the announcements, a feeling of, of optimism, um, the sun is shining and we're all really, you know, looking forward to our industry getting back on its feet. Um, certainly from brands' perspective, they have been given the confidence um, from the announcements and hopefully the the step-by-step -step, um, unlocking. Um, the second half of the year it is definitely um, a time for in-person events to happen. That said, it's essential that there is this hybrid element to every um, branded event that we're um, organising and every brand that we're talking to. So um, really optimistic, but, but um, having the, the online platform and something really fantastic, this you know, new fantastic hybrid reality um, is going to make things, well, I think even more enhanced. So really exciting. I completely agree. And we've recently done some research with our corporate event planners and, and found that that same prediction was there in terms of you know, the latter half of this year is when everything is going to be you know, kicking off again. Yeah. I mean, Adam, you, your clients, are you hearing a very similar thing from, from them in terms of the positivity and also that hunger for maintaining a hybrid element? Yeah, I think um, our clients at the moment have, have come out of that sort of car accident of not quite sure knowing what to do, how to plan, and are now thinking, OK, Perhaps for the next six months, we're going to stay hybrid or uh, virtual, but then the move is going to come back into hybrid. There's a real appetite out there to get back into venues, to start creating experiences. But really what, what most of the briefs that I'm getting that are coming in are, OK, we need to have a hybrid element. And the hybrid element is really important because it's, as I say in, in the film, it democratizes the experience because we've got to run two things in parallel. We've got to have the live experience where we, we, we're at the venue, we hear, um, a bit like sport really. We, we've often talked about that analogy of, of, of being at somewhere like Wimbledon where you have all the fun, you've got the strawberries and cream, you hear the thwack of the ball, but also we're gonna pro be providing like the pundit, John McEnroe, giving the analysis where Nadal has just served at 127 miles an hour for the third time and, and we actually see that in slow motion. Similarly, we're going to be able to give content to the digital audience which is not going to be available to the actual in the room person. So those experiences are going to be different but they're uh, uh, of equal value and that actually makes it really exciting. And I think what I'm hearing more and more is that this is like a turn. It's a, it's a turn at the time when our industry needed to embrace this new 
technology. And it's meant actually that were I to be a large corporate and normally I might be able to have 200 people, say at Banqueting House, having a lovely dinner and experiencing all the history and all that that meant. Actually, I might have 2,000 people dialing into this event and seeing the, uh, the things that used to take place at Banqueting House and getting some real content. So I, I think the future is really looking rich and promising. And I think the industry is really adapting to it. Just being in this green screen today, I mean, is a good example of that. Yeah, it's, it's been weird because the industry almost was a little bit technophobic and was scared of technology. It was like mm. technology is going to take away live events. And there was this fear that it was almost live events versus technology. But the last 12 months and particularly now has, has really emphasised the fact that actually they come hand in hand and work beautifully together and, and actually create an even better and more engaging experience. I mean, but what does it mean for venues? Yeah, funny enough, I, th I think that's a really key point for us. Certainly uh, prior to 2020, I think that venues had, certainly we did as a portfolio of venues, really struggled with the concept of what a virtual event would mean and what the role of the venue would then become for events. And certainly, you know, if the future of events was to move very much more into this virtual realm, actually, what does that mean? What part do, do, do venues then have to play? So that, of course, was something that we were, we were quite challenged by. And also how to monetize that for a venue in terms of, you know, what if it is a virtual event going on, how do we actually make that a, a commercial viability for us? Um, but since 2020 hit, um, of course, everything changed, as we know. Um, and the conversations that we had previously had with event partners like Wise and Private Drama um, obviously accelerated exponentially. And we really started to understand the, the technology that was involved and how that could help us to create really um, actually incredibly engaging digital solutions for our clients, which still enabled us to give them a venue experience. And that, of course, is the key part for us. We want to still be able to be a key part of what's going on for the event. Because for us, we love to think that, you know, a key consideration for, for clients when they're planning their events is where they're going to host that event. Um, and when you walk through the doors of a particular venue, you know, you walk through a palace gates and you, you're, you're, you're on site and you've got that tangible feeling of walking in the footsteps of history, walking in the footsteps of kings and queens. There is a real emotive, real emotion that you get from that. And we don't want to lose that, of course. So the really exciting thing for us about hybrid events is that it actually gives us the ability to not only have that going on at one point, as you say, in one, one room, you've got that dinner going on with a live event, but also find ways to create really engaging content to actually give a completely different um, venue experience to those people who are online and watching it digitally. So actually, 2020 has been a, a, a real eye-opener for us, actually, and a real positive step because it's really helped, it's forced us, actually, to really rethink how we use our venue spaces um, and how we're using venues for events and also reframe what that venue experience can look like and actually how do we bring the venue to the client rather than having to only have the client come to us. And as you say, the, the engagement for us is significant, significantly um, expanded potentially because there's no capacity restrictions for the people who can, can be in part of the digital, part, the online um, part element of the event. So for us, if we can create really engaging, wonderful venue experience content, actually that's great for us. We get a much wider reach rather than just having you know, the people who are in the room. So for us, it's a really exciting opportunity. A perfect example of that is, and I'm sure the majority of our audience will have binge watched this at some point in the last month or so, Bridgerton. Yeah. You know, we, we all experienced these incredible venues and these royal palaces, but we did it from our own homes. Yes. So it can be done. Yes. You can create those experiential elements. But I'm keen to hear from George because, you know, we're, we're painting this beautiful picture of, of live and hybrid events and how you can do this and you can do that. And I feel like, you know, it then falls on you to actually execute that. <laughs> so what, what is it? Well, I think, uh, yeah, there, there's, um, there's a, often a fear amongst clients that, um, you know, how are we going to create something at this kind of level where audience expectations are now getting higher and higher and higher? And if you rewind the clock to sort of March, April last year, when a lot of people were only just discovering Zoom for the first time, think of how far we've now come in terms of the, the calibre of content, the types of platforms and the expectations on 
audience interaction and how that actually is going to work, uh, you know, expectations are now very high and the technology has got to deliver. Uh, and I think, um, you know, where we come from when we approach a, a virtual event and now approaching hybrid events is that the quality of the content is absolutely critical. Mm. You know, we're now being benchmarked against broadcast television, Netflix, you mentioned Bridgerton, and that applies to everything about the event. So, you know, the, the, the quality of the camera work, you know, the, how slick is the studio broadcast? Um, what does the set look like? How good is the sound? Like I said, the barometer is really high now. And I think what we've learned over the past year is how to think like broadcast TV producers and to think about that online audience in terms of what are their expectations? How are we going to engage them? How are we going to keep them engaged for the duration of this event? Most TV programs are 30 minutes. The average evening live event starts at seven o'clock and goes on till 11 p.m. Now, you're, you're never going to square that. You're never going to engage an audience for hours and hours. So how do you hit them with the content really hard and make sure it sticks? And so they go away with more of a compressed experience. And obviously the live event is, is, is longer because there's more going on. They're having a meal. They're doing all those other things. So I think for me, yes, the technology is important, but having the audience in mind throughout is what is critical. And I think that is one of the major things we're learning and continue to learn as we move into hybrid. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And we talked about um, client expectations a little bit earlier on. But Louise, your clients are, are, are hyper luxury. Like, yeah. And I feel like that's a, a whole different level of expectation. And you know, can hybrid events satisfy that level of, of luxury that's needed and, and we're used to by going to places like palaces? Yes. Um, yeah, as you said, we um, produce events um, for luxury brands, you know, from Hermes to Cartier, Louis Vuitton, um, Dom Perignon, Veuve Clicquot, the list goes on. And the expectations from our clients and from their clients are, you know, exceedingly high. Um, I think what we saw during, um, you know, lockdown and this last year, well, as, as you all touched on, we've all had utter Zoom fatigue. You know, there had to be a better way. And just like Liz said, it, this has forced our hand to come up with other solutions where we could amplify the event beyond the room. And I think that's always been a kind of key um, target of our clients, of our luxury brands. How do we amplify um, this event outside of the people just in this room. So we've um, been developing, and it's about to launch um, an online platform specifically for luxury brands. It's called Livio Events. And it's, um, as you said, it's a live stream, um, and it's all about um, quality. Um, what we saw from some of the luxury brands were things like um, fashion shows, and that was just a live stream. And it, it, it worked, but it, it, people quickly lost interest. It has to be interactive. It has to have backstage content. It has to have um, an opportunity. A lot of people said part of the fun of going to these events was chatting to other people in the industry, was you know the, the social element of it. So what we um, are providing our clients with is, first of all, a fully customizable online platform. So it will look exactly like a Louis Vuitton um, Netflix screen or a Verve Clicquot Netflix screen with the branded colors. Um, interactive elements is so key. So backstage content, Q&A with uh, the CEO, um, chat between people at the event. Um, and then um, the other very important thing that we think has come out of this is the commercial aspect. Um, we will have a direct link to an e-commerce site. Um, we recently did a high jewellery collection for um, a uh, jewellery brand. And it was really fascinating for our client to see, you know, what, what are customers looking at? What are the favourite pieces in that collection? Um, what are they buying? Um, who's the profiler of, of people looking at, you know, certain collections? So it's from an ROI perspective, it's a fascinating time for our luxury brand clients as well. And, and another reason that these hybrid events are going to be continuing throughout, you know, the end of this year, but, but well into 2022. And I hope, I hope forever. So you mentioned about audience interaction. So it would be a crime if I didn't get some of your questions answered. Um, one of the questions is, does the panel think customers will expect hybrid to be included in the base rate? 
This is open to the panel. Who wants it? <laughs> I mean, I can certainly have a quick jump in about venues. Um, <coughs> funnily enough, this is something that we are reviewing at the moment, and I don't have an actual definitive answer, but certainly what, how we are looking at this we are essentially going to be completely looking at our pricing structure because we will be using the venue spaces differently. And so therefore we don't feel that we can just um, use our normal rate cards for, 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 the, for the hiring out of the spaces. Um, but what, we are, what our ambition is to do is to actually create a catalogue of um, digital content um, that is hopefully fabulously engaging and, and, and wonderful for, the, for those um, audience members to watch, um, that we can essentially then put a value on and package up and sell as a bolt-on to essentially the live element of the, of the event. So that you would hire the event space to have your live event as you normally would do. And you can, um, and you can also purchase this, the bolt-on digital content that will then be, that will go out to, to the online um, audiences. That's not the only way that we can do it, of course, because we could do things that are bespoke. And I think it will just, at the moment, we're reviewing how that's going to work because ultimately it will all come down to how they're using spaces um, and in what way. Because, of course, if someone's coming on to just do some filming for a couple of hours, we're not going to charge them for a full venue rental. So I think this is still sort of up for discussion, certainly with us, but it's something that we're reviewing and it won't be just a kind of our, our standard flat rate, I would say, from our point of view. I think um, also one needs to look at the actual value of the event in terms of what, what are the audience going to be or the client going to be getting from this. And I think we have to slightly shift our perspective as opposed to an event that would perhaps take place at uh, Hampton Court Palace, for example, that would have an audience of, say, two to three hundred people. This is different because it's reaching so many more people. And also uh, the other thing that we haven't mentioned is legacy, is that we now will have content that that actually can be looked at later, can be analysed, can be shown to an even wider audience, not only the digital audience, but also a wider audience go going forward. And I think that we have to look at the analytics that it's also going to provide. I know Louisa touched on this, but we are now able, at the end of a digital event, to actually almost kick out stats straight away. How long do people look at this event, stay on this event? Did they interact with it? I mean, we've already, um, at, at the venue that George and I I host events in the Shutter Lounge, we have these stats after every event. And in fact, we've discovered that people are really engaging with this content. And so I think that if you bring those two things together and look at this third element of legacy, the pricing of that has to be, has to be relative to that. So I think it, it will, whilst the price, I think, will be consistent of staging what a, a, an event used to be, I think that the actual return on investment will still be there. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, I really liked the, the, the e-commerce bit that you mentioned, actually, because it's, it's interesting to see the commercial benefits of hybrid events. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned there, you've got the legacy benefit because the, the content kind of lives on um, and it's not just on stage and then gone. So looking at those and especially commercialising the hybrid element, you know, George, from your perspective, you know, is it as simple as pretty much throwing up adverts like like a TV show would. Absolutely. You could, you could do things like that and you could uh, you know, leverage the power of your digital audience to monetize an event. But also, let, let's not just think about uh, the, the obvious choices of, of, of brands and, and people selling things. Let's look at the potential of a hybrid event from the perspective of someone like a charity. So uh, we produce a number of charity uh, galas, some of which with, um, with Adam's team uh, throughout the year. And yes, you know, there are 300 people in a room, uh, like a banqueting house, there's an auction, there's fundraising, but also there's often some really, really high value content, an A-list performer uh, performing at the end of the night, um, or, you know, celebrities coming up and giving messages and things. And what we're proposing for hybrid formats is to say, well, take some of that really, really A-grade content and bring it into an exclusive online only forum. So that's where that studio concept comes into play because you say, you know, let's say you have got Ellie Goulding performing the headline set at the end of your event. Well, let's bring her into the studio while the guests are having dinner for an exclusive online Q&A. Maybe as part of that, she could auction off something, you know, a signed guitar that she's used the previous gig or something. Something that only the online audience are getting on top of what's happening in the main room. I think 
the, one of the biggest questions we get um, around hybrid events is how do we avoid that them and us mentality of the people in the room having a great time, getting all this lovely food and drinking amazing wine, and the hybrid element is just sort of cameras. It's almost voyeuristic of watching all these people have a great time. How do you avoid that feeling and make the online audience think, I'm getting something that's just for me, and as a result, I'm willing to put my hand in my pocket and make a donation or purchase that product or go to that website and have a look at some more information. And people are only going to do that if they feel emotionally motivated to do it as if they've had something out of the event that you know it has been designed and curated just for them and I, and I think that's again going back to the point I made in the video earlier is it's just not going to be enough just to stream an event that's not a hybrid event and I think that's the assumption that maybe a few months ago clients were making but things have moved on hugely now and the question actually is um, how can I make uh, the, the, the online component perhaps even better than the live event? Um, that, that's that's, so that's right. the challenge. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think going back to your point about um, costs and, and investments, it's going to turn budgets on, on their heads as well. Um, and I think, look, the in-person event is always the premium offering. Nothing is better than walking into banqueting house, being handed a glass of chilled champagne and looking up at the Rubin ceiling. Absolutely, that is a premium experience. Um, but there's 300 people there having that. There could be 10,000 online. And therefore, if you're the, the, the person at the, at the end client holding the purse strings, how do you carve up your budget? Do you do it in a sort of a quick and dirty way on numbers? Um, or, or do you do it on the impact of, of what that budget will do to each experience, both live and online? And I think that's a debate that's going on in a lot of companies right now. Actually, it's a good point that you make in terms of the, the online content could potentially make that that element of the event um, even more engaging than what's going on live because of course if you if certainly in terms of venues and how we can how we can sort of create curate actually content for them there are so many things that we could do as you say like live q and a's or behind the ropes tours and you know, look at collections and objects that no that public aren't allowed to see all of that kind of behind the scenes things will actually mean that we as a as a company's HRP would be able to engage actually potentially much more profoundly with those people because we can get so much more so many more stories over to them and, and so much more connection with them because we're able to curate that content that they're having rather than just being in the room and, and experiencing you know the, the emotive experience of actually being physically there so I think that actually there there is something to be said that the the, the online platform element can actually potentially be more engaging for us and give us a good connection with those people. I'd 100% sorry uh, agree with that as well in terms of the luxury brands and and what we're hearing is it it has to be almost better than than what's happening in the room. Yeah. They have to have VIP access to things that people in the room don't have. Yeah. Um, I know that we also talked about um, events, we did a, a large event with um, a beauty brand, it, it was purely online, um, but we sent them hampers, we teamed up with a Michelin star chef so that everyone at home was getting um, the same meal, They we have a, a hire, a luxury hire tableware company called Maison Margot, so they each had a beautiful tablescape that was hand painted in the colours of the, the brand, so a, a really unique, bespoke luxury at home experience and I think that can also accompany hybrid events so they're getting something seriously special. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, th I think, um, think one needs to think of this holistically which is what is very exciting about hybrid events and engaging all the senses. So something, uh, the person at home or the person in the office who unpacks something absolutely gorgeous, some lovely hamper, maybe there's a cocktail kit in there, maybe some music and then they're, they're actually seeing, they're getting some access to and some insight that wouldn't normally happen at the experience. And I think George is really right to touch on that charity element who because we share many clients who are working in charities I actually think that the amplification the opportunity to raise more money is really there just think of Live Aid what that uh, that impact that Live Aid made on all our lives in terms of giving and that was just a broadcast experience imagine if the ambassador from that charity actually was to sit down with an interviewer and really tell a story about what working for that charity or what that charity actually meant to them on a personal level I think it could be hugely powerful. It's interesting as well because you've, you've talked about these experiences that are 
incredible. And I'm wondering how that then translates to incentives. Because, you know, six months ago, people were saying, well, you can't do an incentive online or you can't, you know, it has to be in person. But now, actually, from, from hearing the different things that you've said, having a Q&A with Ellie Goulding on a private Zoom call with just 50 of you, that's an experience that you probably wouldn't be able to get in, in a live uh, atmosphere. Well, otherwise it would cost a, a lot more. Um, so how, how are incentives evolving when it comes to this sort of hybrid technology? Well, I, I mean, sorry, I was uh, jumping in there. I, I just think, again, there's such fantastic opportunity. If I attend an event, say, at uh, the Tower of London, I'm going to go into the White Tower. I might go and have a quick tour of the, uh, of the crown jewels. But what if I actually got some insight from a beef eater about the ceremony of the keys or something really special that uh, I wouldn't have time for were I to be involved in a dinner, hearing a speech perhaps from the CEO of the company, but actually got some really special insight as well as having that other opportunity. Mm. I don't know, this is more your... Uh, yeah, that's absolutely correct. And that's, we've been, we do actually have quite a, a high percentage of incentive travel that comes to our um, our venues and also international clients and this is exactly where it lands really well for us because of course they can't travel at the moment and chances are that they might not be able to for quite a while um, and it does enable us to still keep those relationships going with them and be able to offer them something which actually could be even better and even more enhanced and, and give them a, a much more, more deeper um, engagement with what, what we have on offer at the venues. So we've had a question um, which I, I like, um, and it's how do you see hybrid working for conferences rather than these sort of fun evening events? Like we, we've been illustrating all of the, the most fun events you could do, but let's kind of take it really corporate. And I don't think conferences have to not be fun, yeah. but, you know, when it is maybe more educational and less celebrity or less party, um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um... Well, we, you know, I main, we mainly deal with luxury brands, although in my past, and we certainly still um, put on conferences. I think the whole element, the content element, again, the Q&A um, section, the, the chat section, you know, and actually, George, you'll be able to answer this well, I think, probably um, better from a production I, I point. I think the challenge with the conferences, uh, <laughs> one, one of the lines we started using a lot over the last year was um, a, a line we came up with, which we've stolen from, from broadcast world, was, was the rule of a third. Whereas if, if your in-person event was um, three hours long, make the online component an hour, you know, just compress it all. And it's very difficult to do that with a conference. Conferences are all day. People turn up at nine o'clock, they have sessions, you have a lunch break, you have an afternoon tea break, and it goes on to the evening. And then traditionally in the evening, you'd have socialising and networking. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not that keen on sitting at my laptop for eight, eight nine hours. Um, so what could we do with a hybrid component? Well, an example might be, and let's, let's go back to the sports analogy. Let's, let's take uh, the, the, the Wimbledon. Um, we're, we're all working. We can't sit down. I'd love to um, watch Wimbledon all day for two weeks, but we can't. So what do we do? We tune into the highlights with Sue Barker at seven o'clock and we get a condensed stripped down. This is what happened at Wimbledon. Here are the key moments. Here's the analysis. See you tomorrow for day two. And that is the sort of thing we're going to be starting to see with, with conferences. People going, I want, I want the highlights. I want the snapshots or... I just want the bits that are relevant to me. So I want to be able to pick and choose. I want to be able to create my own conference at the end of the day and view the sessions that interested me. So what does that mean for people like us in production? Well, we need to be turning around live content into on-demand content immediately. So as soon as a session is finished, get that edited, get that online, ready for the online audience to digest. So I think that's gonna be really important. What's the other reason people go to conferences? to network and that's where I think the platform developers you know we, we, we're not a platform developer we're a production company but the platform developers are working so hard and millions is being invested in improving the networking experience on a lot of platforms and they're all thinking about it from a hybrid perspective now how can an in-person guest network with an online guest you know, how could that be done at an event um, so you know people are starting to think about this but I, I do think when we think about events like conferences, we shouldn't have this um, immediate thought of that, well, we'll start the live stream at nine o'clock and expect everyone still to be watching at five, because I tell you right now, they won't be. <laughs> I think you're you're right on the networking at the conferences, and that's certainly something that we've been developing. Um, you know, 
uh, the ability to have breakout sessions where you um, beforehand you kind of choose five uh, people that you might want to network with. It's almost like a bit of a LinkedIn that's going on online. So that that's certainly something that we've been been looking at, Livio. Yeah. And you, you mentioned the the on demand content. One of the questions links to that. It says, you know, will venues be pre producing, establishing VTs, etc., for hybrid events to make use of? And, you know, I guess you're the, the, the first person I would go to with that question. Um, short answer is yes, we, that is our ambition. Um, I think ultimately there will be, be sort of two ways that we will do it. We would like to um, build, as I said, a sort of a suite of content that is pre-recorded and has, you know, specific um, content that is relevant and wonderful for those particular uh, venues. Um, so yes, we would like to pre-produce some content, but I think that there also will be, um, always will, there will be events that want to have their own bespoke content. And so we will also work with, of course, our production um, partners to help us build that specifically for individual clients if they want to. Um, but um, yeah, absolutely. We would like to have a catalogue of um, curated content that has some great messaging, has some great stories. And, and ultimately, actually, at the moment, we're working on producing that while we're closed. We're working on producing that suite um, of, of digital content and, and actually speaking to clients to find out from them what it is about the venues that are the USPs for them. So, you know, we can presume that there are certain stories and certain things that people want to know about different venues, but actually, what is it that clients want to know about or want to hear about or want to see when they're in these venues? And then we can pre-package that up and have that available um, going forward. Yeah, That's such a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With, with pre-recorded content, this, this is something that <clears throat> I remember speaking to event planners in-house with, within our own company and also others. And at the beginning of lockdown, the idea of pre-recorded content was an absolute no-no. It's like, no, it has to be live because that's where the interaction is. But I think that mentality has changed a lot. And actually, what you mentioned about quality, George, in, in terms of you know, having that pre-recorded content, just like the VT that we showed you at the beginning of this session, um, you, you can't really do that live. But even the live element, if we're thinking of this as like a talk show, now the Jimmy Fallon show, for example, that's pre-recorded hours before it's broadcast. Mm -hmm. So there is the live element and then there's the digital element, but neither of them are live, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, yes. so what's the balance of pre-recorded versus live and, and how does that work best? So we, I mean, we've been experimenting a lot with this in the Shutter Lounge where we stage events, where we make a, a lot of what we do appear to be live. And we also have live content going on at the same time. So we might have, for example, the host will be live, the DJ will be live, um, there'll be some other contents live, and then we'll mix that in with pre-recorded, but create the illusion by the editing, by how we move from a pre-recorded sequence into a live sequence. The, the other thing is that I, I think what's really come out to me is this ability to be able to interact with the content on screen. So if I feel that I'm watching something and I can just type something and the host is going to respond to that question has made it the, the interaction really powerful. Um, that, that's something I think that's really important. I think Adam's right. I think if you are live, you've got to validate to your audience that this is live. So if, if that validation isn't going on, if the, if the audience can't sort of see that what they're putting in is coming out the other side, then why, why be live? Why have the risk and often the complexity um, and, and the additional costs of, of being live um, if, if the audience member isn't getting anything out of that? So, you know, that's one of the key questions we always start. And you're right, it, it always used to be, it has to be live. And when you actually go through the questions of why, often you might come to a different conclusion because there, are, like you say, there are huge benefits of pre-recorded content. You know, the, the magic of post-production just elevates everything, you know, and, and we work some really talented uh, directors of photography to produce our content. And, you know, the, the, the ability to, to shoot things many times from different angles and really, you know, convey the beauty of something like a physical product, uh, you're going to always want to do that pre-recorded uh, because it gives you more control over the final output. Yeah, I mean, a perfect example of that is I watched Hamilton on Disney+. Plus. I'd seen it live in New York, which was a fantastic experience. I was a few rows back, and you have just the one view. When you have that pre-recorded version that's, that's then streamed, you're getting 
close-ups of Lin-Manuel Miranda and suddenly you can see the sweat dripping down from their brow and you can feel the emotion in their eyes and, you know, I'm still a massive theatre goer, but I think that there are those elements that pre-recorded content can do. You also mentioned that I should reiterate that it's live. This is live, okay? This is live, <laughs> right? The questions that you are coming, I will get them. There are loads flooding in, but I promise you your questions will be answered. One of them um, is, is an interesting one, actually, because we've talked about how great the digital experience can be, better than the live in some ways. To play devil's advocate, how do you, um, how do you balance that so that actually, especially with conferences, for example, to get them to even bother turning up to the live one. You know, if the digital experience becomes so good, then they might just be like, you know what, I'm just going to stay at home today, put it on my laptop and uh, not bother getting dressed. I think the networking aspect of conferences, you know, you cannot beat a face-to-face. -face. It's, it's still, there's still such a need for people to be in a room together and just, you know, from a human perspective um, and a business perspective. So um, deals are done in the room. Absolutely. I think that's the thing, you know, that, that that's where key sales are made. That's where uh, negotiations are undertaken. So I think there was there's always going to be a reason. But, it, it, you know, the, the new reality we're heading into does pose some questions around um, drumming up audiences. So. Uh, you know, something that we spoke about the other day with some clients was, um, you know, if, if working from home, especially amongst you know, big corporates, is here to stay, um, a lot of the audiences that used to go to um, sort of exclusive gallery openings and things, that's because they were at seven o'clock, they're in the office and they do it on their way home and they jump on the 11 o'clock from Waterloo back, back to their home. Well, now you've got to perhaps get your audience from home into town uh, and, and give them a re reason to do that. So, you know, I think, you know, everybody knows how to, to, to make sure a live event is sufficiently exciting to generate that audience, but there are going to be some new challenges. And if an audience member has an option, well, I could go or I could watch it online, I think we may start to be surprised about the, the decisions some people are making depending on the type of event and their personal um, feeling whether they need to be in the room or not. I think also that um, a, a, a comparison is invidious. I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. They're just different. And you get different things out of, uh, out of both types of things. So, so that for the, for the live event, you're absolutely right. Being there, m deals are made, people are, are networking, you can read the body language. But the other thing, and we, we've been exploring this, is, OK, so for the virtual event, I might choose which camera I'm looking at this event from. So I could actually say, oh, I prefer sitting upstairs and having a long view, or actually I'd like to come in close and sit in the front row, or I'm bored with sitting in the front row, I'm going to go over here. But also, I'm now going to talk to this group of people on a network, on a private network, and talk to them about what I'm actually hearing. So I think the experiences are different. We shouldn't compare them, I just think they're different. Yeah. I'm keen to explore <clears throat> the future like we, we've talked about you know things that we kind of know about the audience is probably quite familiar with some of the possibilities but but what's on the horizon i mean i've seen some some incredible xr uh technology and you know some of the ideas that we've come up with probably might involve bits of technology that people aren't necessarily aware of and some of the questions that have come through include you know you know what what technology would you like to see to push hybrid to the next level? So what elements do you think may be on the six month to a year horizon that could actually upgrade hybrid events even further? George, maybe I'm going to throw this at you first. I, I, I think the way online audience interacts will, will change dramatically. So, um, you know, you look at all the major uh, streaming platforms, their, their, their audience interaction is pretty much the same across all of them. There's a live chat, there's Q&A, you can have polls, um, you can do one-to-one -one video networking. Um, but I think what they, they were all designed to deal with fully virtual events, because let, let's be honest, that's where the money was when lockdown hit. Um, none of us were going into a venue. So all these platforms were mainly designed around 100% virtual attendance. Now these platforms need to evolve and they need to bridge the gap between uh, the online audience 
and the, the live event. So I think what we're going to start seeing is more innovative ways of people interacting. Um, so digital avatars is something you're starting to see a lot of now. So people um, might uh, you know, enter a, a virtual space as an avatar and be able to move around and interact with people. Um, I think that's something that's very exciting that we've seen some, um, some really cool things going on. I think also think about, well, if, if things like conferencing, networking is key, what might technology, might meet, what, what might what we need to deliver in the room to enable someone at the event to talk to somebody remotely? So, um, you know, hybrid networking booths or, or sessions where people go in. And, and I think we're starting to think about how that physically looks. And I know I keep borrowing things from the world of television, but at the end of the day, television is where a lot of this stuff um, gets, emerges first. If you look at some of the uh, Saturday night shows like Anton Deck and Britain's Got Talent, they've built sets around the audience. So huge LED walls with hundreds and hundreds of, of people sat at home. And people think that's fake. It's not. It is live. Um, they have live video links and audio links with hundreds of people. They're bringing that all into the production. And Anton Deck can just choose one and they can talk to them straight away. And I think we're going to see some of that te technology now borrowed and brought into live events because, it, it, again, it really makes the online audience feel that they're part of the experience and they're not just a passive viewer. Hybrid networking, I think that's, that's such a, a great concept that I didn't even think of, that actually, yeah, the, bridging the, the two audiences. We we're always talking about bridging the content, but not the actual audiences mm. themselves. Adam, what about you? What are your thoughts? Well, I, I, I hope, bearing in mind how far we've travelled over the last you know, eight, nine months, I actually think it, um, that it won't be very long before actually we get 3D content actually coming into people's living room so that we actually see something in the space itself. Television is going that way anyway, and I don't think it's going to be very long before that happens. So that you could actually, it's a bit like, do you remember how revolutionary it was when Kate Moss appeared in Alexander McQueen's fashion show? Actually, uh, um, uh, uh, in an illusion called Pepper's Ghost, but it was incredibly effective. Well, actually, I don't think, bearing in mind how far we've traveled, that it's going to be very long before, for example, we, we might follow in the footsteps of one of the kings of England into the King's Gallery and actually be taken on a curated tour or that we um, see an ambassador from a charity actually telling us and they're appearing in our living room. So I, I think that mixed reality, it's not very far away. People are already talking. I think also to pick up on that, as well as borrowing techniques from television, we're going to start borrowing techniques from gaming. Yeah. Um, uh, so the uh, virtual environment we're sat in now was created using Unreal Engine, which is the power behind Fortnite and lots of other you know, blockbuster games that you know, people play on their consoles. And, uh, you know, what do we learn about gaming is, is it's highly interactive now. People wear headsets, they can talk to each other in real time. And I think the events world could learn a lot as well from, from the gaming world yeah. and the kind of experiences that you can create through gaming. And again, photorealistic 3D environments, you know, we can recreate these beautiful venues to exact detail in 3D. Um, and, and, you know, people can stick on a headset or, or grab a controller and navigate them themselves. And I think that's very exciting. That's a really interesting. I, I'm almost getting to the stage where I'm thinking the Matrix and people will be <laughs> plugging themselves in and just, you know, going straight oh into gosh. these digital worlds. So that, that's a, a scary bit of sci-fi for you that's, that's potentially there. Um, on the venue side, uh, one of the questions that's come in is what is the minimum tech that venues should be providing? Because we're, we're talking about, you know, the future technology, but also present technology. It, it's how much of that is, is now on you? Well, that's a very good question, um, and I think it will depend on the venue, if I'm honest. Um, certainly for um, the venues that we manage, um, we will have certain limitations in terms of what we can actually um, install in the venues because we can't make intrusive um, installations in, in, into the fabric of the building. Um, However, um, that said, of course, we do need to ensure that we have the basic level you know, of, of, course, of course, good Wi-Fi, um, comms connections, all of that sort of thing. But how we would normally work with our venues is we, of course, have event partners that we work with, likewise, um, who we would uh, the client would then bring on to sort of bring all of that tech in with with them. Um, so we don't necessarily um, we wouldn't be able to install everything in-house in our venues. But I don't think that's necessarily going to be the same for all venues. I think that there's actually going to be an expectation that there is a level um, 
uh, certainly um, of you know video, VR, and all of that sort of ability um, to, to have in the venues. Or, or use um, event partners who can bring it in because then of course it's bespoke to whatever the client wants because actually if you if you if you're putting installation into a venue it becomes a very fixed product that you can then deliver to the client but actually um, uh, you know it works well to have that flexibility that the client can essentially choose what they want and how they want it to, to work I, I think um, another thing that uh, is changing the game is 5g so, uh, it, you know, it's going to change the game for us as consumers of the content because it's very soon we will all have extremely fast internet connections on our mobile devices. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> living in the countryside with a, a slow broadband connection will no longer be a problem. But for us as the broadcasters, it also gives us an ability to, um, you know, broadcast from anywhere uh, because the, 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 the speeds that we'd get from 5G. And certainly when we visit our venue partners in London, um, some of my colleagues have got 5G on their phones. I haven't yet. And they get their phone out and they're getting lightning speeds in central London. And, and that will be a game changer for our ability to, to, to broadcast from anywhere. That's a really key point that you've raised there because we've talked about venues installing the technology, but with a hybrid audience, you've also got that home audience and, and what their technology limits it to, right? So, you know, we talk about the gaming world. I mean, yes, you want it to be the equivalent of what Halo graphics or, or you know, I haven't played games in a long time, as you can tell. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, PlayStations and Xboxes have the engines to create these incredibly high graphic environments. But the average conference delegate, for example, probably doesn't have that kind of power behind them. And, and often, you know, they struggle with Zoom, you know, and, and unmuting themselves. So <laughs> there's, there's an element there where almost we're limited by what's at home. And, and how do you then kind of navigate that? It is a really good point. And I, and I think, um, you know, when, when virtual events uh, were really the mainstay of, of what, what our corporate clients were doing, that was the area of nervousness is, is, you know, what if something goes wrong? And, you know, we had to sort of reassure them that, look, everything we're putting in the signal chain is as good as it can be with all the backups and redundancy and backup Internet connections. It's all there. But yes, you're right. At the end of the day, you're relying on the the digester of the content at home and their internet connection. And, and that's something that we as event professionals, unfortunately, have very little control over. And, and that's going to be the risk point. And, and, you know, unfortunately, it's always the way it's the most important person watching the event that has the slow internet connection and, and had a dropout at the crucial moment. It's just life, isn't it? Um, so, yes, I think there, there is often going to be a disconnect with the aspiration of what can be achieved and what the end user is almost capable of uh, consuming, both in terms of their tech and their level of knowledge. But as Adam said, things are moving at a million miles an hour. And I think, uh, you know, we, we don't want to sort of push audiences too far. Uh, a prime example of, of that was, do you remember when 3D TVs came out? And, and it was almost like forced upon people. This is going to be the greatest thing ever. Everyone go out and buy a 3D TV. And the, 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 the consumer went, no, actually, we don't really like this very much. And um, we'd rather just have, you know, better normal TVs, really. Um, so I, I think we need to be careful not to be, you know, forcing really high tech things on on the end user that they're not ready for. But I think we can certainly start showcasing the technology, having that discussion. Um, but going back to the content needs to be tailored to the audience, the technical delivery needs to be tailored to the audience as well. And I think we need to think about, um, you know, who we're broadcasting to and what they are comfortable with. Uh, and often in the corporate world, one of the biggest considerations is actually security of that content. And, and there might be the perfect platform for what we want to do. But if it's not compliant from a security perspective, then it's a non-starter as well. Yeah, I think data breaches, I mean, Sony themselves got hit a couple of years ago and, and I think that's that's an element that's now a new consideration for event planners um, you know we've talked about the tech at home but you know Louise you mentioned about hampers that can be delivered at home and obviously with luxury brands you, I imagine you're not sending out a lot of luxury products to you know a bunch of people for them to just have a look at so how are you balancing the physical things that are at, at home or, or not at home for example um, well, I mean, for, you know, uh, very high-end jewellery, for example, no, you're not sending products um, <laughs> to people's houses. But like I said, we teamed up with the Michelin star chef and uh, 
guests are receiving, you know, an ultimate luxury experience with the, this Maison Margot tablescape. I think we touched on it briefly, but, you know, what a hybrid event allows um, at-home users to see as they go through a, a beautiful, stunning render of the exhibition is um, amazing close-ups um, of the facets of the jewels or of the watches or whatever the product might be of the clothes. Um, and also, um, you know, incredible content and footage of where that was sourced, how it was made, um, you know, any fact that you need to know about it, seeing it um, turn from all different angles. Um, there are really amazing things you can do with luxury products that give you a much more 360 um, view to it. And I think, you know, we touched on the commercial side of this as well, but being uh, brands being able to directly link e-commerce sites to directly see what their um, customers are viewing, how many times they're viewing them, what the, the, the online, you know, live feedback. And then for us to be able to give our brands that information, that's just invaluable. And that's something that has been a real challenge for the events industry in the past. How do we prove the ROI? Events historically, you know, would the department to kind of the budget would be cut first because it was very hard to justify spending the money in events. I think with hybrid events now, what's going to be really fascinating moving forward is that it will give the brands very, very clear data um, that will prove, you know, exactly the return on investment. Yeah. Well, I'm conscious of time and I, I appreciate there have been many, many questions that have been thrown at us. I hope that you will feel satisfied in the interaction there. But before we go, I'd like to hear just, just a key takeaway from each of you that you think can really raise the level of those that are trying to implement hybrid technologies and trying to raise the standard of hybrid events. That's, that's the reason people tuned in. Let's, let's give them something to go home with. So starting with you, Adam. I think for me, it's investment, investing in your content, which is everything. That is the live event and not forgetting emotional engagement. Mm -hmm. I've got to engage with my audience, either in the room or, or through the hybrid uh, example. I, I'll give you a very quick example. We, we used a trick and it really is a trick. A magician called Magical Bones came into the studio and does an interactive trick where the audience at home get four cards. They get instructed with him to tear them up and then they uh, put, throw away nearly all the cards except for one and they discover in their pocket that they've got another one and they put them together <laughs> and, and it's the same card. And that, that's something very special that emotionally engages and connects with them. So content and engagement, I think, are everything. Um, I think for me, um, certainly uh, with my background, obviously, it, it's going to be about uh, venue experience and still being able to um, ensure that clients are getting some kind of valuable um, engagement, again, um, with with the venue so it's not just sitting at home and you know looking at something nice on the on the computer um but there is still some kind of emotional connection that they come away with that is valuable and lasting for them um for me i think it's the interact you know what's going to take this away from being a zoom or a live stream is the interaction of of everyone on that platform the going behind the scenes the Q and A's. We've mentioned Ellie Golding a lot, um, but you know the the access to the CEO that you just might not get if you're in a crowded room at the live event, and of course being able to reach thousands more people um, than you would uh, with a with a with just having 200 people in the room is just an invaluable takeaway and something really exciting about about the new reality. I think I'd echo Adam's point about investment in the content. I think that is uh, absolutely crucial. And I think one key takeaway for me is remember that you're producing two experiences that overlap. And I think uh, remembering both audiences. And I think, you know, as event producers, we've all come from the live events pedigree. And we're all now having to wear that TV producer hat as well. And that is a huge challenge. But I think understanding the, the, the different needs of each audience and what is going to tick their boxes is going to be absolutely crucial as we move into hybrid. It's fantastic. And I think there's been so many really good points that have been raised. We've gained inspiration from TV and broadcast. We've gained inspiration from games. Um, even Ellie Goulding, uh, <laughs> just to leave the audience 
Starry-eyed. See what I did there? Oh, oh God. <laughs> it's probably embarrassing that I know the discography of Ellie Goulding, though. So on that embarrassing note, I will say thank you to everybody that got involved at home um, and thank you to our panellists as well. It's been a really good in dis uh, discussion and it's nice to see that hybrid events are the future and also are going to be pretty exciting.